John, I want to talk about the relevance of philosophy in the modern world. There are some scientists who say that the only value of philosophy is to keep bad philosophy off my back and that philosophy is pre-scientific. General public might think that philosophy is ivory tower-ish. Uh, what's the value of philosophy in the modern world? Yeah. Well, uh, it has a very large number of different values, but a lot of it depends on what you think is valuable. Uh, to me, uh, these questions are absolutely fascinating. Uh, I cannot imagine living a life without being obsessed by philosophical <laughs> questions. I've always been obsessed by these questions since I was a small child. So, What are your favorites? Well, my favorites is um, how does the mind represent reality? How does language uh, express the mind? How is a society formed and maintained? And above all, what's the nature of the real world and how do we have access to the real world? That's a start. I mean, I, I have lots of other favorites, but those are, uh, okay. uh, those are initial uh, questions that puzzle me. And I can't imagine somebody uh, not being interested in those questions. But I, and I wouldn't want to give you the idea that the value of philosophy depends on whether or not it's got some practical use in the marketplace, because the value of philosophy is like the value of anything that's valuable in itself. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and it makes life um, worthwhile, really, to have uh, philosophical questions and philosophical answers. Uh, nonetheless, there are a lot of practical importance uh, to uh, philosophical investigations. Uh, and in particular, as a general uh, critique of uh, society and intellectual life. Uh, so, for example, here's an interesting philosophical uh, question. Uh, the social sciences uh, proceeded essentially by imitating the natural mm -hmm. sciences. To some extent, that was successful, but in most cases, it really wasn't very right. successful. Now, that raised an interesting philosophical question. How, are the, how is the subject matter of the social sciences different from the natural sciences? And how is it different in ways that would render the model provided by the natural sciences inappropriate for the social sciences? That's a straight philosophical question, and I think that is an important question. But another uh, point I would want to make is, at the level at which I work, I don't make a distinction between philosophy and science. So a, a, a narrow scientific question is, how, what causes cancer, let's say? A philosophical question is, what's the nature of causation? Uh, and of course, the nature of causation is uh, effectively, or that question is in part addressed by thinking how causes work in the sciences. So we have had to alter our conception of causation by discoveries in physics. There's a constant interplay between philosophy and science, and indeed the very greatest scientists like Einstein or Newton uh, are philosophers. And, uh, and uh, Einstein, uh, both of them thought of themselves as philosophers. But some scientists say that ju just that kind of question, what is causation, uh, science has usurped philosophy, and yeah. philosophy was doing all sorts of things that really weren't addressing the question, coming up with dead ends and paradoxes, and science is just getting down to the facts and how it works, and, and now they know causes, and some are you know, Newtonian and some are quantum mechanical yeah. and yeah, but the and problem now we know. is that they <laughs> don't make it look as if all of this is already established or, or this discussion is still going on uh, this is a discussion that's uh, very much still in progress uh, Einstein we, I mentioned Einstein earlier he could never accept quantum indeterminacy right, he right. thought it cannot be that cannot right. be the and, that, and that's a philosophical objection. That's a philosophical objection. Right. Now, the fact is, we've had over 50 years of experiments, and they always support quantum mechanics, in particular quantum indeterminacy. Mm -hmm. But as I said earlier, I, at the level at which I'm trying to work, I don't make a distinction between philosophy and science. I, there are certain sorts of experimental procedures which are more or less cut and dried. You perform the experiment, and it comes out, or it doesn't. But at the level that I find interesting, uh, where you're asking yourself, well, what is the significance of all of this and how much do these methods apply elsewhere and what's the logical form of the explanation provided by this type of investigation? Uh, I, I, I think those are essentially uh, questions where there's an overlap, of what, where you can't make a sharp distinction between philosophy and science. I have no difficulty arguing and discussing with my uh, scientific colleagues in Berkeley because we all recognize there's a common enterprise and uh, 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 just different ways of approaching different aspects. There are a lot of the questions that interest me most, though, that, that uh, most scientists can't see are real questions like how does language relate to reality they think well that must you know it must be some uh, atomic explanation of that uh, or uh, what's the ontology of society see even most social scientists tend to take that for granted they tend to take society for granted there were the earlier uh, founders of sociology like Durkheim and Weber right, right. they said something about it most of it 
pretty confused because they didn't have a, an adequate theory of language or society. So when you deal with, uh, with ontology of society, uh, is that a purely theoretical or, or can that actually help understand the process of society if yeah. you understand the, the fundamental being of what it is? Yeah, I, I think I, if you want to understand anything, you better understand the ontology. You better understand the nature of the phenomena that you are describing. Now, I have to tell you, most social scientists... Uh, don't worry about that. They, I mean, uh, I, I, I know a guy who's doing studies of uh, trade unions, uh, the decline of uh, uh, trade union membership. Mm -hmm. It's a straightforward sociological problem. But what exactly is a trade union and how does it relate to other institutional structures and how do these institutional structures come into being and how do they continue to exist? Those, to me, are the fascinating philosophical questions. And if I and were, should that inform his study? I think or it should. Or will it confuse I, him? I, no, I, well, <laughs> who knows? Uh, that's always a possibility. But I think you're bound to do better work if you have a deeper philosophical mm -hmm. grip mm -hmm. on the material. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I, life is short. And if a guy wants to devote his life to just studying decline in trade union membership and not worry about all these philosophical problems, that's okay. It's a free country. But my own view is you get much greater philosophical depth, a much greater intellectual depth, if you understand the ontology, if you understand the theoretical underpinnings of what it is you are investigating. What about some counterintuitive elements, such as backward causation, which seems to express itself, at least on the micro level, in quantum mechanics, and some cosmologists would even apply that to the whole universe in, yeah. in some ways uh, that seem so uh, absurd from yeah. a philosophical point of view. Well, I, I, there isn't any such thing as the philosophical point of view. Yeah, different philosophers have different points of view. Uh, frankly, I think the notion of backward causation doesn't make any sense because I think there's a connection between the notion of causation and the notion of time. However, that is itself a theoretical issue, and that's something that's not something where the answer is given in advance that requires further investigation. Mm -hmm. Another view in uh, physics, uh, not a popular view, but one you hear sometimes, is that in fact our universe is one really of an infinite number right. of possible universes. Mm -hmm. So I could have worn a blue shirt today, yeah. but that just says there is another universe exactly <laughs> like this one, where these two guys are talking, and this guy who's my counterpart yeah. in that universe, he's wearing a blue shirt. And everything else is exactly everything the is same. Exactly. I think this is total nonsense. However, I, you know, a lot of things that seem to be nonsense at one point in history turn out to be not so dumb later on. So I don't want to outlaw it, it's just I can't take it seriously. I cannot take the infinite universes seriously. What's the space in which they're supposed to be uh, existing? Well. It has to be a different space. Uh, it has to be an infinite number of different spa spaces. What does that mean? Is this space next to that space? Then it looks like they're in the same space. But in any case, so I, I, I don't want to outlaw discussion. It's just some of it I can't take very seriously.